صلوا على محمد وآل محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل ولعنة الله على أعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Respected elders, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, we've had the opportunity to share some reflections on the life and the legacy of Dawood alayhi salam. And I want to continue our discussion on Dawood looking at Ayah number 26 of Surah Sad. Surah 38, Ayah number 26. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, Ya Dawood, inna ja'alna ka khalifatan fil ard. O Dawood, we have appointed you as a khalifa, as a vicegerent on the earth. Now notice that this ayah comes immediately after the story about the two disputing, disputing parties, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about how Dawood alayhi salam essentially makes a judgment without hearing from the defendant. And we mentioned some of the opinions of the scholars on, this, on these verses, on this story. And we mentioned the view of Sheikh Nasr Makarim al-Shirazi, who says that Dawood technically did not commit a sin because he gave the correct judgment, but he just did not follow the necessary protocol. So it didn't constitute a legal sin. But then I shared with you the view of Allama Tabatabai where he says that this mistake of Dawood was not made in the real world. What happened, the entire incident had no external reality. It was an unveiling, it was a kash. So the mistake that he made is similar to a person making a mistake in their dreams. It's not the world of taklif. And because Dawood salam is such a God-fearing person, even when he makes these minor errors in judgment, in a world where there is no taklif, he immediately turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. And here, it's as though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now says, Dawood, you have now reached a level whereby I want you to be my representative on the earth. Brothers and sisters, when we reflect on the meaning of Khalifatullah, you know, this is a very lofty, honorable title that Allah gives to a person. For Allah to say to a human being that you are my representative on earth, what that essentially means is that this person is going to do the work of God on earth. You know, if I appoint someone as my representative, even on a human level, the expectation is they're only gonna do things that are pleasing to me. If I appoint you as my representative, the understanding is you are going to represent my interests. 
the things that I approve of. So when Allah says to Dawood, Inna ja'alnaka khalifatan fil ard, Dawood has reached a point in his spiritual development whereby his interests and his desires are perfectly aligned with Allah's. Perfectly aligned. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, Ya Dawood, Inna ja'alnaka khalifatan fil ard. And then what does Allah say? Fahkum bayna nasi bil haq. And therefore, judge between people based on truth. Be fair when you judge. And then Allah says, Wala tattabi il hawa. It's amazing. Allah is speaking to a ma'asum. And Allah still warns him of following desires. Wala tattabi il hawa. And this goes to show, brothers and sisters, that the infallibility of David is a result of his caution. So it's not that Dawood is unable to commit a sin. He has free will. What makes him ma'asum and us not ma'asum is that he is very careful about not succumbing to the lower desires. وَلَا تَتَّبِعِ الْهَوَىٰ فَيُضِلَّكَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ You see, brothers and sisters, many of our inclinations our desires are not aligned with divine values. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the human being this internal compass, and nafsul lawama. You know, when we do wrong, we feel guilty. That feeling of guilt, this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has endowed us with to help us navigate these moral choices. You know, it's as though, you know, if you look at Surah Al-Qiyamah, لا أقسم بيوم القيامة ولا أقسم بالنفس اللوامة Allah swears by the Day of Judgment, which is the external Supreme Court. And then نفس اللوامة is like the internal Supreme Court that blames you when you do wrong. There is an internal mechanism of accountability. Day of judgment is the ultimate day of accountability. It's an external accountability. The self-accusing soul within you is that internal mechanism of accountability. Allah has given this to everybody. But some of us, we ignore it. We feel that guilt, but we continue to commit sinful acts until that conscience until that fitrah is extinguished. And then we no longer feel any guilt or remorse. Ya Dawood, inna ja'alnaka khalifatan fil ard, fahkum bayna al nasi bil haq, wa la tattabi al hawa, fayudillaka an sabil illa. When Allah tells Dawood, do not follow desires. It means don't follow your desires. If you have any desire that does not conform to God's law, you have to resist it. Do not follow your desires and do not follow the desires of others. As a king, as a judge, you have to prioritize the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala above everything else, even if it makes you unpopular. You know, sometimes, we give in to pressure because we want to please others. Allah says, وَلَا تَتَّبِعِ الْهَوَىٰ Do not follow the desires. Your desires are the desires of others. Because if you do that, it's going to lead you astray. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Mu'minun, Surah 23, Ayah 71, it's a very powerful verse. He says, وَلَوْ اتَّبَعَ الْحَقُّ أَحْوَاءَهُمْ لَفَسَدَتِ السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَنْ فِيهِمْ Allah says, if truth 
Listen to this very carefully. If truth was based on the desires of people, Allah says the heavens and the earth would have been ruined. You know, if you look at the world today, unfortunately, many around the world are not living their lives according to divine principles. They're living in accordance to their own desires. And we live in a world where the world is so polarized, there's so much confusion, and we've lost grip of basic realities. I never thought that I would ever live in a time where it is a heated debate to ask for someone to say, define what a man is and what a woman is. The fact that this is a heated debate, this is a controversial issue that shows you that people are no longer living in accordance with divine values. They're following their desires. And then the ayah continues. Those who turn away, who go astray from the path of God, for them is a severe punishment because of their forgetfulness of the day of accounting. You know, brothers and sisters, the Quran in many ayat emphasizes that remembering death and remembering the hereafter gives us resistance against our lower temptations. You know, this is why the Prophet ﷺ, he used to visit Jannah, Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Muhammad wa The Prophet used to visit Jannah al very often. For those of you who've been to Medina, there's a cemetery adjacent to the Mosque of the Prophet. Now you can imagine the Prophet on a regular basis, he would, after finishing his salah, he would go to Jannatul Baqir to visit his relatives who are buried there, to visit his companions. And he would stand there, and the Sahaba, they would stand with the Prophet. And the Prophet would recite what we would call a ziyara, a ziyara of those who are deceased. But look at how the Prophet would address the dead in that cemetery. He says, Assalamu alaykum ya ahl al diyar al muhisha. Peace be upon you, O the inhabitants of the lonely places. You are the inhabitants of the lonely places. I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but. I drive past cemeteries. I have never seen a cemetery that is crowded with people. Sometimes you see people here and there, maybe they drop some flowers, but generally cemeteries are relatively empty. Even if the person who's buried there was a celebrity, even if they had thousands of friends and admirers, at the end of the day, the majority of the time that grave there's no one around it. Assalamu alaikum ya ahl al diyar al muhajir. And that goes to tell you, brothers and sisters, that no one is going to be with you after death except him. So that's why prioritizing his pleasure over your pleasure and the pleasures of others needs to be a priority. Assalamu alaikum ya ahl al diyar al muhajir. Antum lana farat. The only difference between us and you is that you went ahead of us and we will soon join you. And then the Prophet ﷺ, as all of the Sahaba are listening, he starts to give news about what's happening in dunya. He gives, he gives the deceased, the dead, an update. He says, diyar faqad sukinat. Oh, dead people, he's speaking to their souls. 
If you're wondering what happened to the homes that you left behind, they're now occupied by others. The homes that you built and you furnished, other people are living there now. أَمَّا الْدِيَارُ فَقَدْ سُكِنَتْ وَأَمَّا الْأَزْوَاجُ فَقَدْ زُوِّجَتْ You left spouses, your spouses have moved on. They got married. They moved on. وَأَمَّا الْأَمْوَالُ فَقَدْ قُسِّمَتْ You want to know what happened to the money? It was distributed among your heirs. هَذَا خَبَرُ مَا عِنْدَنَا This is the news that I have for you from dunya. فَمَا خَبَرُ مَا عِنْدَكُمْ What news do you have from the world of the hereafter? The hadith says the Prophet paused and he lowered his head. And then he said, أَمَا وَاللَّهِ لَوْ أُوذِنَ لَهُمْ بِالْكَلَامِ لَقَالُوا تَزَوَّدُوا فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ الزَّادِ التَّقْوَى The Prophet says to his companions, By Allah, if they were given the ability to speak, they would have said to all of us, Prepare for this journey. Prepare for this journey and the best provision for this long journey that you have ahead of you is taqwa. Is God consciousness. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout the Quran He reminds us that you have to be aware that there is much more beyond death. Your real life comes after death. Now what's interesting about Dawood alayhi salam is that you know, when you look at the, the kings and the prime ministers of the world, oftentimes we only find out how much money they actually have after they die. We realize that they've been hoarding and they have all these offshore bank accounts. They were looting the government. They were looting public funds. Dawood salam was a hard-working person. Even though he was king. And I want to share this, this hadith with you. So Dawood alayhi salam, he's a king. But even though he was a king, he lived a very humble life. He did, however, depend on the public treasury for his personal upkeep. So he had a stipend from Baytul Mal. And this was, this is normal. You know, usually government workers, they have a salary, they have a stipend from, you know, the public funds. Their salaries are paid by the taxes of the people. Imam al-Sadiq, he has an interesting narration. Imam al-Sadiq, salawatullahi alayhi, he says, Awhallahu ta'ala ila Dawood. Imam al-Sadiq, he says, Allah once revealed to Dawood. إِنَّكَ نِعْمَ الْعَبْدِ O Dawood, you are an excellent servant. I'm pleased with you. لَوْ لَا أَنَّكَ تَأْكُلُ مِنْ بَيْتِ الْمَالِ وَلَا تَعْمَلْ بِيَدِكَ شَيْئًا Allah says to Dawood that you're an excellent servant of mine. I'm pleased with you. But there's one quality that you have. I have one reservation about you. And that is that you depend on the public treasury for your livelihood. And you don't work with your hands. You don't produce anything. You rely on public funds. The hadith says, فَبَكَى Dawood." Dawood, he began to cry. Again, he's not committing a sin per se, but Allah says that it would be better if you made yourself financially independent from the public treasury. 
فَأَوْحَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى لِلْحَدِيدِ Allah revealed to the iron. أَنْ أَلِنْ لِعَبْدِ دَاوُدِ Allah softened iron for Dawood. فَأَلَانَ اللَّهُ لَهُ الْحَدِيدِ فَكَانَ يَعْمَلُ كُلَّ يَوْمٍ دِرْعًا From that moment when Dawood realized that Allah did not want him, it was not pleasing to Allah for him, to rely on the public treasury, he started to make shields with his own hands. And every day he would spend a few hours fashioning, taking that iron and molding a shield, coats of arms. And he would sell each shield for a thousand dirhams. فَعَمِلَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامُ ثَلَاثْ مِئَ وَسِتِينَ دِرْعًا Throughout the year, he produced 360 shields. And he sold each of them for a thousand dirhams. وَاسْتَغْنَى عَنْ بَيْتِ الْمَالِ And he became financially independent. He was no longer depending on the public treasury. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He praises him for that. In fact, in Nahjul Balagha, we have a khutbah where Amir al Mu'mineen, he mentions Dawood alayhi salam. The Imam mentions another thing that Dawood used to do to provide for himself and his family. Imam, he says, وَإِنْ شِئْتَ ثَلَّثْتُ بِدَاوُودِ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ In the khutbah in Nahjul Balagha, the Imam mentions the examples of a number of prophets. And the third person that he mentions in this khutbah, I don't remember which what khutbah number it is, but he mentions Dawood. And he says to his audience, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib is speaking. He says, if, oh people, if you want me to tell you about Dawood, I'll tell you something about Dawood. He says, Dawood is Sahib al Mazamir. Dawood, he had a very beautiful voice. Waqari ahl al Jannah. You know, brothers and sisters, in Jannah, there is a hierarchy, there is a social order. So, for example, in Jannah, Hassan and Hussein are the masters of the youth of paradise. Al Hassan wal Hussein, Sayyida Shababi Ahl al Jannah. Jannah is not an egalitarian place where everyone is equal. No, there are darajat, there are ranks. Al Mahdi Tawus Ahl al Jannah. The Mahdi is the peacock of the inhabitants of paradise, meaning that he is the most beautiful, he is the most attractive. Right? Your eye immediately goes to him. Imam. Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says, Dawood is one of the reciters in Jannah. Which means that one of the pleasures of Jannah is that Mu'mineen will listen to the beautiful voice of Dawood alayhi salam, reciting tasbih, dhikr, and other things. فَلَقَدْ كَانَ يَعْمَلُ سَفَائِفَ الْخُوصِ Imam, he says that Dawood, even though he was a king, he used to do manual labor. He used to take, he used to take, he used to make mats out of the palm leaves. He used to make mats, straw mats, with his own hands. The Imam says, كَانَ يَعْمَلُ السَّفَائِفَ الْخُوصِ بِيَدِهِ وَيَقُولُ لِجُلَسَاءِ أَيُّكُمْ يَكْفِينِي بَيْعَهَا Dawood would make a straw mat with his hands. And he would say to his companions, which one of you is willing to sell this for me? وَيَأْكُلُ قُرْصَ الشَّعِيرِ مِنْ ثَمَنِهَا he would take the money that he would earn from the straw mats that he would make and he would buy barley bread for himself. He would literally eat
from his own labor. My dear brothers and sisters, when it comes to providing and working, this in and of itself is a form of ibadah. Right, so we have, we have a narration where a man, he comes to visit Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al-Kadhim, salawatullahi alayhi. He comes to Imam al-Kadhim and he sees, the narrator says, Ra'aytu Aba al-Hasan, which is the kunya of Imam al-Kadhim. يَعْمَلُ فِي أَرْضٍ قَدْ اسْتَنْقَعَتْ قَدَمَاهُ فِي الْعَرَقِ The narrator says, I went and I saw Imam Al-Kazim working in his garden. He had an orchard and he was sweating so much that the sweat was dripping on his feet. He was dripping with sweat. فَقُلْتُ لَهُ جِعِلْتُ فِدَاكَ أَيْنَ الرِّجَالِ He says to Imam Al-Kadhim, where are you know, your workers and your servants? Basically he's saying that, why are you doing this work? Don't you have anyone else to help you? It's as though he's trying to say to the Imam that it's unbecoming of someone like you to do this type of work. Imam Al-Kadhim alayhi salam, what does he say? He says, قَدْ عَمِلَ بِالْيَدِ مَنْ هُوَ خَيْرٌ مِّنِّي The Imam, he says, there are those who are better than me who used to do this type of work. فَقَالْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَأَمِيرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَآبَائِي كُلُّهُمْ كَانُوا قَدْ عَمِلُوا بِأَيْدِيهِمْ Imam al kadhim he says, the Prophet used to work with his hands. Ali ibn Abi Talib used to work with his hands. Just today, I was reading a narration that says, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib emancipated a thousand slaves in his life from his own personal money. Do you know what that means? You know, when you want to free a slave, do you know how you free a slave? Slave owners are not going to just free their slaves. You go to the master and you say, I'll give you X amount of money to release this person. And the, the amount of money is probably equivalent to your car. The Imam was not someone who's faqir. You know, sometimes we have this impression that, oh, Ahlul Bayt, they're maghloom, they didn't have money. No, no, no. Imam Amir al Mu'mineen was not a poor person. Imam was high in production, low in consumption. He used to produce. He freed a thousand slaves from the sweat of his brow. So Imam al kadhim says that you're, you're surprised to see me working in my garden. Those who are better than me, they used to work. They used to engage in manual labor. وَهُوَ عَمَلُ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالْمُرْسَلِينَ وَالصَّالِحِينَ all prophets worked. All of them used to provide, they used to produce. Abu Basir, one of the companions of Imam al Sadr, Salawatullahi alayhi, he says, Abu Basir says, Sami'tu Aba Abdullah. Abu Basir says, I once heard Imam al Sadr say, إِنِّي لَأَعْمَلُ فِي بَعْضِ ضَيَاعِي He says, I heard the Imam saying, sometimes I go out into the field and I work, I work on my farms. حَتَّى أَعْرَقْ And I work out in the fields. Who's speaking? Imam al-Sadiq is speaking. He says, I work out in the fields until I start sweating profusely. وَإِنَّ لِي مَنْ يَكْفِينِي And I have people who can do the work for me. But I want to go out and work. Why? لِيَعْلَمَ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ أَنِّي أَطْلُبُ الرِّزْقَ الْحَلَالِ Because I want Allah to see me working hard to earn halal money. You know the problem 
today is that everybody wants easy money. They just want to be rich overnight. Ahlul Bayt always encourage their followers. Now, of course, sometimes when you say you should work hard, they say, no, Sheikh, I want to work smart. I don't want to work hard. Okay, work smart. But produce something that has value. Don't just invest in markets like it's a, a casino. Produce something that has value. You know, brothers and sisters, Alam al Majlisi, he says, Kana Amir al Mu'mineen, Lama Yafrug min al Jihad. You know, sometimes you wonder, what does a day in the life of Ali ibn Abi Talib look like? Have you ever thought about that? Like, what, what is a day in the life of Ali? This hadith gives us a glimpse into how Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib used to spend his days. Kana Amirul Mu'mineen, Lama Yafrug min al Jihad, Yatafarragu li ta'lim al Nas. If Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, when he finishes jihad, because that's the priority. So Imam Ali, for example, he comes back from the Battle of Badr. Okay, what's, what's his priority? His, second, if his number one priority is defending Islam and the Muslims from external threats. After he comes back from the battlefield, he devotes his time to teaching people. Ta'aleem. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib was a teacher. لِتَعْلِيمِ النَّاسِ وَالْقَضَاءِ بَيْنَهُمْ And after he finishes that, he would resolve conflicts between people. So, jihad fi sabilillah, when he's finished teaching, and he basically would be like a counselor for people, a judge. They would come and they would bring their problems and the imam would judge. He would give judgment and he would adjudicate Disputes. And then if, when he finishes that, what does he do? فَإِذَا فَرِغَ مِنْ ذَلِكِ اشْتَغَلَ فِي حَائِطٍ لَهُ يَعْمَلُ فِي يَدِهِ After he finishes teaching people and resolving their problems, the imam would go out to his gardens. And he would work in the gardens with his own hands وَهُوَ مَعَ ذَلِكْ ذَاكِرُ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ And as the imam is working in the fields, he's praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is, this is Ali ibn Abi Talib. And I'll conclude with one final hadith as the time is limited tonight. You know, brothers and sisters, growing up, many of us maybe have this impression that it's not good to want to have a lot of money, to, to want to have more money. We almost think that I should just be satisfied with what I have. Even if I have the ability to make more, I should just be content. That's not true. If you are able to earn more money in a halal way, it's mustahab. Contentment comes into the equation where you've done your best, this is all you can earn, you should be content if you can't earn more than this. But if you can earn more, you should. And I'll share this hadith with you. قَالَ رَجُلٌ لِأَبِي عَبْدِ اللَّهِ A man once says to Imam al-Sadiq, وَاللَّهِ إِنَّا لَنَطْلُبُ الدُّنْيَا وَنُحِبُّ أَن نُؤْتَهَا A man says to Imam al-Sadiq that, Ibn Rasulullah, we love worldly things. We love worldly gains. And we love, for, uh, we love to gain from the dunya. فَقَالَ تُحِبُّ أَن تَصْنَعَ بِهَا مَاذَا Imam says, what do you want to do with the dunya, with the money that you earn? قَالَ أَعُودُ بِهَا عَلَى نَفْسِي وَعِيَالِي I want more money so I can look after myself and my family. وَأَصْلِنُ بِهَا And I can take care of my relatives. وَأَتَصَدَّقُ بِهَا And I want to give charity. And I want to use the extra money to go for Hajj and go for Umrah. Imam al Sadiq says, Laysa hadha talab al dunya. The Imam says, This is not seeking dunya. Hadha talab al akhirah. 
This is actually seeking the hereafter. So if your riz is halal, there's no problem in wanting more halal riz to do more good. So if you are earning, don't say, I'm just going to be content. If you're able to earn more, and basically you should try to earn more because you can do more good. You can make your family more comfortable. You can take them to Hajj. You can help the poor. You can help your relatives. And this is exactly the legacy of Dawood and all of the prophets. They worked so that they would not be a burden on the rest of society. And in fact, they would use their disposable income to lift others out of poverty. وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين.